SJC 13282, Michael Cuddy and another v. Philip Morris USA, Inc. And SJC 13346, Mary Fuller and another v. R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company and others. Great. Okay, let's start with Attorney Moxon. Thank you, Chief Justice Budd. May it please the court, I'm Shea Moxon. On behalf of the plaintiff, Grace Fabiano, personal representative of the estate of Ralph Fabiano. Ms. Fabiano timely filed her wrongful death action within three years after Mr. Fabiano died, but the trial court dismissed it because the time for filing a personal injury action had expired before Mr. Fabiano passed away. And that was error, and this court should reverse, because the legislature has made its intent clear that the only time limit that has any bearing on the viability of a wrongful death action is the one set forth in the wrongful death statute three years after death. Well, what if, uh, as we have held, that this is a derivative action? I mean, how do we reconcile the derivative nature of the wrongful death um, action with this three-year statute of limitations that suddenly revives upon death an action that has been dormant? Uh, the, as I discussed in our briefs, the, the principle of derivativeness is useful to address issues that have not been specifically uh, considered by the legislature or addressed it, uh, in the wrongful death statute. But here we have uh, a pretty unique situation in Massachusetts where, um, I, I, in addition to the plain language of the statute, we have the fact that this legislature at one time put a provision in the statute that clearly meant exactly the same thing that the trial court ruled here and then subsequently deleted that very provision in uh, 1981 amendment to the statute. And I'm referring to the provision that said, no recovery shall be had under this section for a death that does not occur within two years after the injury which caused the death. Isn't it clear though from the context that that was to address the uh, discovery rule? Uh, no, Your Honor, because this was put in the statute in 1958, uh, th the same legislation that uh, created most of the statute in its current form. So it was added in the statute in 1958 when no one was even thinking about discovery rule. I don't think it was uh, even discussed or considered until around 1974, and it was, it, the discovery rule was uh, created by the court originally. Um, so, but- What I mean by that is a two year, you know, a, a rigid time frame doesn't accommodate a discovery rule. I, well, yes, but I submit that in 1958, no one was considering the discovery rule, but some significant things that were true in 1958 is that the statute of limitations for a personal injury claim was two years, and because there was no discovery rule in effect, that ran from the date of injury. So when the legislature initially required that the death had to occur within two years for in two years after injury to have a wrongful death claim, that meant precisely that there was no wrongful death action if the personal injury limitations period ran out before the decedent died. And so by deleting that provision in 1981, the legislature made clear its intent that that shall no longer be the case. And you, it, you seem to be having a, a, a debate with uh, opposing counsel on these out-of-state cases from with, where uh, the action's considered derivative, wrongful death cases. And, yes. And their view is that in every uh, case, I, I can't remember how many jurisdictions, maybe 18, in every case where the action is derivative, uh, the, the statute of limitations is tied to the action that the decedent would have. And, and you refute that and say that their take on those cases is wrong. Could you help us out on that, please? Uh, yes, in the instance of four states, uh, West Virginia has rejected the, uh, the defense proposition completely, and there are, uh, I've discussed uh, the Hoover's administration, uh, Hoover's administratix case, which thoroughly uh, rejects the defendant's position, and there are later West Virginia cases that make clear that West Virginia is a derivative state. 
Colorado has rejected the defendant's position, and Colorado has also made clear that it's a derivative state. In Mississippi, um, I believe the defendants have misunderstood the case law somewhat. It's a little confusing, slightly, because in Mississippi, survival claims and true wrongful death claims are both brought under their wrongful death statute, but Mississippi has said that it's only survival claims that need to be initiated within the uh, same limitations period as for a personal injury action, whereas for true wrongful death claims for the uh, survivor's own damages, that period does not commence running until death. And then in Connecticut, uh, kind of a similar divide, Connecticut says that only wrongful death cases based on a statutory theory of liability have to be initiated within the underlying limitations period, but that's not true for those that are based on common law. But also another significant point about before you those are the holdings. Can you tell us the rationale? How do we reconcile this three-year statute of limitations with the action being defined um, derivatively? Uh, oh, uh, I mean, well, what you've just done is summarize the out-of-state um, uh, holdings, but yes. what is the rationale? Uh, the rationale uh, in West Virginia, the rationale was that the requirement to be able to file for the decedent to have been able to sue uh, only had to exist at some time, not necessarily at the very moment of death, and also the rationale that um, statutes of limitation only act on the remedy, not the right. They don't, it's, it's a substantive procedural distinction that the expiration of a limitations period does not extinguish a substantive right. In uh, Colorado, it's likewise that. Um, so here the substantive right was extinguished for the decedent. Well, it's, um, well, I submit no, but I, I want to get back to the point that before we, without even needing to get into the more abstract principle of substantive versus procedural, it's, again, it's a significant point that the legislature has specifically considered this very issue that at one time- Right, so I understand the legislative history um, perhaps being on your side or perhaps you know being a response to the discovery rule, but, but the action itself is tied uh, to the individual who has been injured, and that, in this case, uh, has expired. Well, it's, um, well, um, you know, acknowledging that our main argument is based on the, sub on the uh, legislative history, uh, the point uh, discussed in the West Virginia case, and that's consistent with Massachusetts law, is that before, before, you leave, before you go outside the state, can I follow up on Justice Wendell's question, though? Because we also have the word under the circumstances, right? That appears in the statute. And so you re recover under the circumstances of it, if, the defend, if the injured party could recover, then the, yes. the, the wrongful death plaintiff could recover. Doesn't under the circumstances, isn't that consistent with the derivative language? Um, and plain language, and that under the circumstances language has been in effect since the beginning, right? It's not, it's not changed. It, it pre-existed the 1981 amendment, right? Uh, well, yes, but in that very same legislation in 1958, which added that clause to the, the under such circumstances clause to the statute, the legislature could not have possibly thought that that would mean that the expiration of the time to file a personal injury action during the decedent's lifetime would bar a wrongful death action because it found it necessary to put a whole different provision in the statute towards the end that meant that very same thing, which well, is that it, provision that said no wrongful death remedy is available for a death that does not occur within two years after injury. But th doesn't that, I mean, the, the trial, the motion judge doesn't, say that it has to happen within, it, it's not the same provision, it's within three years of the time in which it, 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 as long as you met the statute of limitations, you have three years, right? That's different from this 1981 provision, which had a sort of a rigid um, end date. 
I'm just trying to make sense of all right. the different languages. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, and, and thank you. Um, my point is that in 1958, mm -hmm. that provision that was later de deleted had precisely the same meaning that as that the expiration of the limitations period for a personal injury action during the decedent's lifetime would bar a wrongful death action. Wasn't because in, in 1958, that period was two years after injury. But wasn't it an additional, in, okay, if we're back in 19, before the 1981 amendment. Yes. So you had to do it with under the circumstances. You had to meet the under the circumstances and you had to meet that two year provision, right? You had to not only yeah. be under the circumstances, but it had to be within two years of the injury, right? Um, yes. So it was both. And then they eliminated the second part of it, but they kept the first part in, right? Yes, and, and my point was that in 1958, when the legislature wrote the under such circumstances clause, it could not have possibly thought that that meant the expiration of the personal injury limitations period during the decedent's lifetime would bar a wrongful death action because it had written another clause that said that far more directly and explicitly being that no recovery shall be had under this section for a death that does not occur within two years from injury. So counsel, and, otherwise, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, if, if, this, if, if we don't adopt your position, what would happen is that if a person figures out they have lung cancer from smoking and they have a long, long period before they die, they could never have a wrongful death suit. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. And, uh, and that is one of the reasons why the legislature could have reasonably decided to no longer follow that rule that they adopted in 58. They may have considered that in those circumstances that they, a person with a disease like that should not be forced to have to file a personal injury claim to possibly preserve a wrongful death claim. The legislature decided that families shall have uh, a remedy for death and that the only time limit that bears on the availability of the remedy is the one that still remains in the statute today, three years after death, without any connection to the time of injury or any other statute of limitations. So that would be true even if there were an accident at the corner of Main and Elm 10 years ago, and the plaintiff could unequivocally show um, causation as it relates to death, even though the um, statute of limitations on the underlying claim of the uh, would-be decedent um, elapsed seven years ago that yes. the wrongful death uh, statute would resurrect that cause of action. Um, yes, although with resurrect, uh, again, um, well, it's, all right. it's, I, I, I think resurrect, I hear, <laughs> I hear your point. He likes that one. Let, let me, uh, <laughs> let me ref, uh, uh, take that back. That, that's, that's sort of a term that maybe doesn't make the point as well. The, the cause of action would still uh, exist for wrongful yes. death, even yes. though the decedent's cause of action on the underlying tort expired years ago. Yes. Yes, and because the legislature has made that decision, uh, we submit um, also because a statute of limitations does not extinguish the underlying substantive right. And um, if the legislature decides that that allows too long of a tail for liability, the legislature always could enact a statute of repose as it has for uh, architecture and medical malpractice cases. But at present, it has made its decision that the only time limit that applies to a wrongful death action is three years after death. No other time limit or the date of injury has any bearing on it. And um, I'm out of time, so I thank the court. I stand on my briefs for any points I didn't reach, and I ask the court to reverse. Thank you. Okay. Attorney Rainier. Good morning. I'm Andrew Rayner. I'm the uh, litigation director for the Public Health Advocacy Institute, and um, I represent the plaintiff in the Fuller case, which is the other case before the court. Um, 
in the, in the three minutes allotted to me, I want to urge the court not to decide the case based on a theoretical construct about what does derivative mean, um, because that actually diverges state to state, and also not to decide the, ca the case based on how other wrongful death statutes have been interpreted, but rather to decide the case based on the unique legislative history of this case, which we've been discussing. And, and just a Kafka, you, you know, on page 44 of my opening brief, I have the statute as more or less it appeared in 1958. And it had three clauses. It had the under such circumstances clause. It had the no recovery shall be had clause. And it had, for the first time, the limitations period based on death. So these were all new in 1958. And what my brother was, I think, attempting to say is if the second clause meant what the first clause, you were being urged to interpret the first clause to mean what the second clause meant. First clause being the which under one? such circumstances clause. That's what. That's and the what second the, clause being. I'm sorry. The second clause being the no recovery shall be had for an injury that occurred within two years of death. That's the one that was repealed. And but but they kept the under the circumstances. So. But my point, my point, and I think my brother's point is, if that meant what you are being, you were being asked to hold that the statute should be interpreted exactly as this provision held. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it said that you could, if the person died after the personal injury statute of limitations had run, you couldn't bring it, but if the person died within it, you could. And that is exactly the what position is, that what the is under are the, What does under the circumstances mean? Because it has to have some meaning. Well, on that, Your Honor, I would ask you to look at the prior version of the statute from 1949. Mm -hmm. Because what you will find there is there was a separate provision for um, if a death was caused by a streetcar. There mm -hmm. was a separate provision for if uh, a death was caused um, by uh, on a public way, but not by a streetcar. There was a, a separate provision for if a death was caused if you by an employer. And so in 1958, they repealed those other distinctions and left only, and, and basically captured that in the under such circumstances clause. So I respectfully submit it was not, it was not the interpretation that you were being asked to hold today. It is not, that language was not right, the- Right, but, but the, I can't remember if you or your brother makes the argument that under the circumstances, I mean, okay, comparative negligence, or, you know, if, if, if the, they couldn't recover, but I, I, don't, I don't know if that's correct, but I'm just trying to, because the only language that seems to track the derivative language is under the circumstances. And also it's hard to try to figure out what the, I mean, the legislature didn't have the benefit of our decision in 2022 or whatever it is when it wrote the statute of limitations in this thing. So reading it backwards is kind of yeah. counterintuitive. Well, but at the same time, under the circumstances is derivative language, and it's the only derivative language in the statute. So I'm trying to figure out what it means. So well, help, tell me what you think it means. I, I think it meant, as, as I, and, I, and honestly, if you look at the 1949 version, and I, I believe it's in one of the briefs, but if it isn't, I'll certainly provide it. The 1949 version articulated multiple different circumstances, including the point Your Honor just raised, the comparative fault. It, you, you will find detailed different provisions, some that said it depends on comparative fault. I believe that was the one with respect to the employer. There was a different one for if it was caused by a railroad, it was a different one if it was caused by a different kind of common carrier. There are literally four. And in 1958, they repealed all of the others, except for, the, I believe, the employer one they left in. And then they put that under such circumstances language in Section 2 to Does capture. Does that mean that, uh, that uh, Schroeder and Doherty were wrong? Well, I, I, I understand that Your Honor <laughs> wrote them, <laughs> and I <laughs> understand that there is a trend in the United States to find uh, wrongful death actions to be derivative, but uh, I honestly think that the intention of that language was something different from what Your Honor found. Now, but, but can you still- Can you tell us what it was? You're saying what it was not. 
Can what, you tell us what you, in your estimation, under such circumstances was, was? It, so if you look at the first section of section two, the first subpart, yeah. the first subpart talks about negligence. The second subpart talks about willful, wanton, or reckless conduct, which is not a cause of action. Willful, wanton, and reckless conduct is, is a scienter. And so it coupled the scienter with the notion of could you bring the action under some common law theory? Could you bring it under uh, for, uh, against a municipality under section one for not properly maintaining the roads? Could you bring it under section 2A for uh, streetcars? Could you bring it under section 2C for railroads? And each of those contained, as I said before, each of those contained different provisions for whether comparative fault applied. Some did, some didn't. There was also the fact that a husband at the time couldn't sue a wife. That was a separate limitation on whether, on such circumstances. So no, I'm not, I'm not here, Your Honor, to say, oh, you must reverse what you did. But what I am saying is that if you were going to give effect to the legislative history, you have to give effect to that second clause, the no, the no recovery shall be had clause, as well as the under the circumstances clause. You have to give effect to both. And when the legislature repealed this, I respectfully submit that they repealed it for the reason that the Fuller case represents, which is Mr. Fuller is struggling, dying from lung cancer. He is um, going through excruciating treatments right at the time when a personal injury action would have had to be, would, he would have had to brought it. And I respectfully submit that the legislature intended not to impose that burden on Mr. Fuller, but to impose, to allow his heirs, the survivors who are the beneficiaries of the third clause, to bring the action, to allow the heirs to come along and say, now that there's time to figure out whether we want to bring this action, instead of making a decision when the person is suffering, to make the decision within three years of death. And that is what I ask your honors to find. Obviously, you used way more than my time, so I thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Attorney Chesson. Thank you. May it please the court, Scott Chesson from Shook Hardy for the Appellees in the Fabiano case. Your honors, this case, these cases are controlled by your honors decision in GGNSC two years ago, where this court held that the beneficiaries of a death action can sue only if the decedent would still be in a position to sue, which is what Justice Wentland has been asking in various forms to both advocates who preceded me. The court held that wrongful death actions in this state are derivative of and dependent on the continuance of a right in the decedent to maintain an action for his injury up to the time of his death. So, counsel, can I ask you? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Um, can I ask you then to explain this legislative history that you're opposing? That's counsel? exactly where I was going to go. You know, it's well, like, good. <laughs> so we're all thinking the same thing. <laughs> there you go. So big softball. The, pro the provision that was deleted in 1981 was very different from and far harsher than the under such circumstances clause, which existed then and exists now. That provision said that no recovery shall be had under this section for a death which does not occur within two years after the injury that caused the death, meaning that a person who, like the sort of hypothetical litigant we've been discussing in the briefs and this, this morning, a person who is injured a day later, a year later, within the statutory period, files a lawsuit, that lawsuit is pending and then you know, a day later, a year later, et cetera, that person dies, even if that person had complied with everything, even if that person had met the statute of limitations for personal injury, under the prior statute, his or her heirs could not bring a wrongful death suit because it was, it, it, there was no provision. I, I'm gonna ask you to be more basic. Hold our hand right through why the 1949 legislative history and, and all the different provisions were in it uh, do, does not support the appellant's position. He, he, here's, my, here's my point, that, absolutely. So in 1958, 
the statute that existed at the time was repealed and replaced with simple language that said that a wrongful death action can be brought for a person you know, against a person who causes the death of a person under such circumstances that the deceased could have recovered damages for personal injury if his death had not resulted. The idea was to eliminate all of the very, I agree with Mr. Rayner that there were a number of different circumstances under which, that were enumerated in the statute and this statute was in, it intended, I assume, to, it, to eliminate the like exclusio unius est, uh, whatever, I don't speak Latin, the, the point, the, 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 the proposition that there are certain types of claims that because they are not enumerated in the statute cannot be brought. This so, is broader so language. Under, under your, your, situa your um, interpretation of everything, if the, defend if the plaintiff, say, in, in like, as such as in this case, uh, the, one of them gets diagnosed in mm -hmm. 20, 2004, right. dies in 2012 or, or 2015, um, if they had brought their personal injury action and settled it and recovered it or had gone to trial, whatever, it's over, they brought it, it's over. What happens then to the statute of limitations I, Well, on the wrongful death case? If I can permissibly break that question down into, into two pieces. If it, the, the situation that Your Honor is presenting is a situation where, that I don't think there's any dispute among the parties about, because at least in the Fabiano case, the, the plaintiffs say this in their brief. <coughs> if there is a personal injury suit that is resolved definitively during the lifetime of the deceased, <coughs> then there's no wrongful death action at all, you know, um, timely or not, either because of res judicata, because there's been a, a, a resolution, or if that <coughs> suit is settled or resolved or released because, as this court held in GGNSC, the wrongful death action is derivative of the personal injury action. You know, Justice Lowy, what you wrote in the beginning of that opinion is that the, the right to dispose of the personal injury case according to the derivative theory belongs exclusively to the injured party. And there are good reasons why that may be. And, and Your Honor distinguished it from independent regimes where, and, and a legislature is free to do this, and a lot of legislatures in this country have done so, where they have said, it doesn't matter what the decedent did. These are separate injuries. These are separate rights. But what this court held unanimously two years ago was that this legislature in this state determined that the wiser course of action was to tie the rights of the beneficiaries to the rights of the deceased. There's also a, a footnote, though, in, um, in Schrader, that, that footnote 11, mm -hmm. that points out that uh, any of our interpretation of the common law must therefore recognize that chapter 229 sets forth, and then it lays out what it sets forth, mm -hmm. and then one of the things that is referenced, it sets forth a statute of limitations. I suppose you're the wrong person to ask this question, but um, couldn't you interpret that, that, that footnote as saying, well, we recognize there's a statute of limitations issue here as well, and we're not digging into that this moment. Well, I mean, your, your Honor certainly has me at a disadvantage in the sense that you wrote the opinion, that footnote, and I did not. That's so. why you're the wrong person right. to ask. You, you, you know what was, what was in your mind. He was and, talking and to himself this morning. But Don't worry. I, 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 I will say this. If I, were, if I were anywhere in the state other than in this room, if I were down the hall and I were, I were arguing to a tribunal that is bound by GGNSC or, or Schrader, I would say I think that opinion is as clear as day that the dividing line between viable wrongful death claims and non-viable wrongful death claims is whether at the time of the decedent's death he, quote, would still be in a position to sue. And the reason for it, and Your Honor went through the reasoning. You said, number one, there's that under such circumstances clause, which again, is very clear. It says a person can be sued for wrongful death if he causes the death of a person under such circumstances where the deceased could have recovered damages. Two parts to that. Causes the death at a time. So in response to my, my brother's suggestion that- and Can you, oh. get, and I don't mean to cut Justice Lowy off, are you, but one thing I don't understand is the under such circumstances only 
It doesn't appear in every clause, right? It, it doesn't appear in the breach of warranty clause it and other parts. It, it also doesn't appear in the negligence clause. So, and the court dealt with this in GGNSC, at least in part. So what the court, in GGNSC, there was a negligence claim. And so what the court said is we recognize that under such circumstances appears in the willful and wanton clause, but not in the negligence clause. But those two things are combined in the disjunctive, and so we read the clause as modifying both. Your Honor certainly could hold that with respect to but, breach but, of warranty. But, but, but how, how, do, how do we yeah. do that? Because it's a little harder I, with breach I, of warranty. I, this is exactly where I was going. I see plaintiff's point that breach of warranty comes after the clause, whereas negligence comes before. So you have to squint a little harder at that sentence in order to do that. But it, here's what I would say. Again, and I direct it back to that opinion from two years ago. What the court said is because of the the or in there, we think the clause modifies both. But in any event, your honor said, there are multiple other indications in that statute that the statute was intended to be derivative. For example, the court wrote, the elements of a negligence-based wrongful death claim are the same as the elements of a personal injury-based, uh, a personal injury negligence claim. The, the elements overlap. The same is true for breach of warranty. Your Honor also said the structure of the whole statute, the fact that the claim for wrongful death can only be brought by the administrator of the deceased's estate, the fact that, and not by the beneficiaries themselves, the fact that there's only one action, even if there are multiple beneficiaries, all contributes to the conclusion that this court drew that the legislature, when it wrote this statute, like the legislatures in the majority of states around the country, intended the rights of the survivors to be tied to the rights of the decedents. Um, and, and the fact is also, I've been thinking a lot about this breach of warranty question, because I, I, I'm with you that it's harder to read the or as doing the work in this case as it did in the prior case. But even if you consider the breach of warranty clause in isolation, I think it's pretty clear on its face that it's meant to be derivative. Because what the clause says is, Wrongful death claims can be brought against someone who is responsible for a breach of warranty under Article 2 of Chapter 106. It's the UCC, the, uh, the, the Uniform Commercial Code. It, it references the Uniform Commercial Code. One cannot be responsible for a breach of warranty under the UCC legally if one is not sued within three years. There is a statute of limitations right there in Article 2 of Section 106 that has to be met before anyone can be a judge responsible. So Attorney Chesson, how should the plaintiffs have gone about this? How would they have been able to sue for a wrongful death? The same as any other plaintiff under any other circumstances. If a person is injured, the legislature gives that person a certain amount of time, not from injury, but by virtue of the discovery rule, from accrual of the claim to bring a, a lawsuit. I mean, Mr. Mr. Fuller, for example, and that's, you know, Ms. Powell will discuss this in greater detail, I imagine. Mr. Fuller actually did sue. sue. He brought a 93A claim. He didn't bring personal injury claims. Those claims were then expired by the time. So you're yeah. saying that, um, say someone does bring, their, bring a negligence claim or, mm -hmm. or whatever, it's settled, then there's no wrongful death claim to be had. I, and this is why I try, the answer is yes. And where, where I said I wanted to break Justice Cipher's question down into two parts. Where I'm getting hung up is the, and it's settled. I don't even think there's a dispute that if there is a settlement. My only point yeah. is there's no wrongful death action. That, so the, that is true. And so I'm just saying. Defendants are, they just get to get off, right? Well, well, no, they don't get to get off. They have liability to the decedent. I mean, look. But they uh, wouldn't have liability to the family members who could bring the claim. Correct, which is, I believe, what this court thought was the intention of the legislature when it decided the last two cases. There are a number of circumstances in which an injured party, through either action or, or conscious inaction, I say conscious inaction because the premise of a discovery rule appended to a statute of limitation, the premise is that a person who doesn't sue does so knowingly. You don't accidentally, at least constructively, fail to meet a statute of limitations. You have three years from when you are injured and you know or have reason to know. What if they know. keep smoking and it's a continuous injury? Say that again, What I'm if sorry. they keep smoking? Wouldn't it be a continuous tort? I mean, I suppose if they could prove that only the smoking within the last three years by itself was a sufficient no, necessary. No cumulative effect. 
Excuse me? So there is a moment in time, one moment in time, not a cumulative effect? Well, a statute of limitations runs from accrual of the claim. Accrual of the claim is when you are injured. So, I mean, I suppose a person who is injured, knows that he's injured, allows the statute to lapse and then sues 10 years later. If, if they're suing for the additional damages they incurred over the course of the preceding three years, I think that would probably be a viable claim. But if they're suing for the injury that they had 10 years before, I, I see my red light is on. I, I'll, I'll end this way. The, here's the gist of what I'm hearing from the court, and I, I apologize if I'm getting it wrong. I, I'm sensing some concern about what the plaintiffs call the, the inequity of cutting off claims of people who would otherwise have valid claims. And I, and I hear that. And Justice Davis discussed this in the decision that is under review. Any time a legislature puts any kind of time limit on a claim, whether it's a statute of limitations or a statute of repose or anything else, that has the effect of cutting off the claim, there's some subset of the population that would otherwise be entitled to recover that isn't because of this procedural default. There, there's, there's a different concern, though, mm -hmm. uh, within that. And, and I think Chief Justice Budd and Justice Seifer's questions get at that little bit different concern, yeah. which is there's, there's, there's no remedy for the death. There's no remedy for the wrongful death. There's implications for loss of consortium. I think that's implicit right. in the question as well. And I, I appreciate the clarification. And, and what I'm getting at is that that is the holding in the prior two cases, that there are certain situations in which a decedent can make choices that affect the ability of his or her heirs to collect for wrongful death. And the legislature has very good reason to want to do that. I mean, what Justice Davis said in the, in the decision under review is that this notion of sort of staccato, on again, off again, forget cigarettes. If I'm a doctor or a hospital or an HMO or like a medical malpractice insurer, and I'm trying to order my affairs and figure out the extent of potential liability and how to set premiums and how to set reserves, I can be fairly confident that a procedure that was performed four years ago that I haven't been sued for is one that I'm never going to get sued for. Not definitely, because there's a discovery rule and there's nuance in it, but I can order my affairs that way. If that claim, if that's true until the person dies and then it springs back to life, there are consequences to that, which I respectfully submit. Cigarette companies are a little different from doctors, though, so that's, that's I, I mean, I get, I get your point, but. My, my point is I'm reading the statute. I mean, I, I, I hear you. And so that's what we're going to figure right, out. Right, I'm reading means. the statute, and I'm reading this court's decision. And what this court said in its decision was the legislature chose to make these claims derivative for a reason. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks the Thanks so much. Time. OK, Attorney Powell. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. My name is Victoria Powell. I'm appearing on behalf of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company and Cumberland Farms Incorporated. I wanted to start by addressing some of the questions that were asked about how to reconcile the wrongful death statute of limitations with the derivative nature of the, of the wrongful death action. And the point that I want to make is that the wrongful death statute of limitations is still doing independent work. So the statute of limitations kicks into place only when the decedent at the time of his death had a viable injury. So when the decedent is not still in a position to sue, there is no cause of action for wrongful death. And the statute of limitations in the wrongful death statute um, doesn't apply. So it really doesn't matter if that statute of limitations is one year or 50 years. If there's not a cause of action that the injured person could bring, then there, that wrongful death statute of limitations doesn't, uh, it's not triggered. But the wrongful death statute of limitations is still doing independent work because so long as the decedent was in a position to sue, it gives the beneficiaries a new three-year period. There was only one day left. Exactly. So if there was one day left for the, for the injured person to bring a cause of action on the date of death, then the beneficiaries have a new three-year period to bring a wrongful death action. The core issue goes back to the first question Justice Wendland asked 
uh, uh, this morning, and, and, and it, it really is, is there anything about the action being derivative as it re might relate to a waiver of claims or a willingness to arbitrate um, in any way uh, different as a matter of reasoning from a statute of limitations? Not at all, because Why? in all of those situations, the decedent is not still in a position to sue. So it really doesn't matter what the underlying defense is. As this court explained in Schrader, the wrongful death action is a continuation of the personal injury action. So and for, if for any reason the decedent would not still be in a position to sue, then there can be no recovery under the wrongful death statute. But if the decedent is in a position to sue, even if they only have one day left on the statute of limitations, the time of death, then they, this, the beneficiaries have a new three-year period to bring um, a wrongful death action. But, but there's one difference between our prior cases and this one, which is we have, ex we have s expressed statutory language. A and again, the legislature wrote this long before we wrote our two decisions from what, the 2020 time frame, right? So, so it's just hard to read back into this derivative nature we have to, don't we have, it doesn't really depend on the exact language because, I mean, we got to interpret what the legislature meant, not what we said, right? Yes, but I think that you can read the under such circumstances clause and the breach of warranty, the derivative language in the breach of warranty section that Mr. Chesson pointed out yeah. consistent can you, with- Can you, th that point I lost me a little bit, because the UCC has a three-year statute of limitations, even though our statute of limitations doesn't even mention the UCC, we read in that three-year period. That, that's clever, but I don't know if that's realistic. Uh, yeah, I'll just briefly address that if that's okay. Um, so the wrongful death statute states that there's a wrongful death action if the defendant, quote, is responsible for breach of warranty under Article 2. In Article 2, there's the breach, uh, the statute of limitations for a breach of warranty claim. So a defendant would not be responsible for a breach of warranty arising under Article 2 if the claim were time barred. So does so, that mean that, art, that Article 2 statute of limitations trumps, is totally dominant for statute of limitations in this wrongful dis? Wrongful. Not at all. They're doing different work. So the decedent had to be in a position to sue at the time of his death, and that's controlled by the but I'm just trying to take your this argument about Article <coughs> 2 to its logical conclusion. So Article 2 has a three-year limitation period for breach of warranty. All right, and, and by the way, is it three years from what? Three years from, in, in the UCC, what is it? Three years from Date what? of injury. So three years from date of injury under the UCC will now trump every other aspect of this in a breach of warranty claim, meaning we it's basically resurrecting the 1981 uh, provision for breach of warranty? Not at all, because they're doing different things. So that, that 1981 language, it's not, so I think the best Hold way. Hold on, so, again, it says date of injury provision in Article 2. Are we, do we have a date of injury for breach of warranty, but not the rest of the statute? No, because all, all that matters is whether the decedent was able to sue at the time of his death. So the Article 2 tells us whether the decedent was able to sue at the time of his death. And so if the Article 2 is telling us whether uh, the decedent was in a position to sue for breach of warranty at the time that he died. But if he was, even if there's one day remaining on that three-year clock to bring a breach of warranty claim, then the wrongful death statute gives us a new three-year period for the beneficiaries to bring a wrongful death action. And we outline in our brief that there are three different situations where a wrongful death action could be brought more than three years after the date of original injury. Um, I'll just direct, that's at page 36 and 37 of our brief. So, thank you.